for anyone who hasn't heard, the uh, anti-Semitism in the world, Baruch Hashem, is growing rapidly, especially in our allied country called America. Um, the uh, weekend, Motzei Shabbat, uh, for anyone who keeps Shabbat, heard it about it in the Motzei Shabbat, anyone who doesn't keep Shabbat, unfortunately heard it during Shabbat, that there was a uh, vandalism on a uh, shul in uh, Los Angeles, and uh, when the keila showed up, or the workers showed up in the morning on Shabbat morning, uh, they saw that the uh, big, fancy, beautiful shul was vandalized uh, by some reshaim, uh, to the extent where they took the sidurim, ripped them apart, the chairs were all over the place, took the sifre Torah, threw them on the ground, ripped one sefer Torah in half. Uh, are we okay? Ripped one sefer Torah in half, Hashem uh, and and uh, the people of the Keilah were shocked. The people on the news are shocked. Beverly Hills police releasing these images of the suspect. Police say he is a white man between the ages of 20 to 25 years old with short, dark, curly hair, wearing glasses. He was carrying a backpack and rolling a suitcase in these images. Police were called to the synagogue around 7 this morning after an employee discovered an open door and items ransacked inside. Furniture was overturned and brochures and other materials were thrown about. Several Jewish relics were damaged. The only one that's not shocked is a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Now, of course, everyone is crying foul because this is not something that any one of us wants. This is not something that any one of us ever thought is going to happen. You know, uh, especially in, uh, in such a uh, rich neighborhood. Uh, you're talking about average net worth is 10 million plus. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a few billionaires in town attending the shul once in a while. So, you know, these are the type of things that you think happen maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe in the projects. Uh, maybe they're happening in uh, places where there's crime is very high. They're happening in places where uh, definitely not a place where there is uh, so much money. So, someone came out from the Kila and made a video and uh, said, look, let's pay attention to what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling us. He says, anyone would notice that the uh, Sefer Torah that was ripped was ripped at a beginning of a parasha. Not in the middle, as he said. Not in the middle. Not in the, uh, some uh, odd section, but in the beginning, the beginning of Parashat Shlach. This is the only reason why I made this video, is to tell you exactly what I saw. This Sefer Torah that was just rolled on the floor, crumpled, bent. The guy looked like he tried to tear it at the seams. It didn't go by any parts, because it's not regular string, it's sinew. There was one part of one of the Torahs that was torn. And where it was torn, the strings of the Torah, where it was torn, it separated the two parchments from each other. I know that nothing happens for no reason. I held the part of the Sefer Torah and I look at it. Do you know what part was torn what parsha it started exactly it started at the beginning of the parsha not that it was just torn in middle of a parsha in middle in middle of a torah portion this torah was torn right at the beginning of a torah portion you know what torah portion that is parshat shelach lecha now, if you're not familiar with that parshat shelach lecha it's the parasha it's the torah portion where the spies were sent to see Israel. 
And if you know anything about the parsha, the parsha is known as the parsha of Lashon Hara. It's the parsha of when of ill speaking. There's nothing else to say. If out of you're looking at fifty two was it sixty yiri three hundred and sixty columns of Torah. And the one column that it's torn, it's the column that talks about Lashon Hara, the entire parsha of Lashon Hara, of speaking ill about each other, speaking ill about the Bet Knesset, speaking ill about Israel, speaking ill about yourself, speaking ill about your family, speaking ill about everyone in Klal Yisrael. Is it a chance? Parashat Shlach, he says, look at that. This is the parasha of the Meraglim. Parasha of Meraglim, where you had some Jewish leaders go to Eretz Israel to scout the area, and they came back and Otsiu Diba. They said Lashon Hara about the, uh, about the place, and Hashem punished them. So he says, from here we learn, from here we learn, what do we learn? We learn we shouldn't say Lashon Hara. Now, let me ask you guys a question. You've been in enough of my shiurim. Do you believe that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to tarnish a place because of Lashon Hara? Because if the answer is yes, if the answer is yes, we should shut down all shuls. All shuls, all around the world. Why? Because there's not a single shul. In the world, there's no Lashon Hara. Might as well just shut down shop, go pray at home. Okay, guys, it was nice to pray minyan, but the mitzvah is... I got a new takana. No, no, no bekness anymore. Why? Somebody here is talking Lashon Hara. Sometimes in the middle of, a, of the bekness, while you're praying, while there's a shield, somebody saying Lashon Hara about somebody else. So we have to look a little further. What else does Parashat Shlach talk about? We're going to designate a certain amount of time of the shield to identify what Parashat Shlach is talking about. Not because it's this week's parasha, but rather because if we're already going to learn, thank you, excuse me, excuse me, if we're already going to learn a message from our holy Torah, we have to learn the message. Now, Parashat Shlach says a lot of interesting things. First and foremost, it tells us who are these people that went to Eretz Yisrael was called Knaan at the time. It says, Kulam Anashim Rasheb Bnei Yisrael Ema. These were not just regular people that went to scout the land, these Miraglim. These were the most distinguished men, the heads of the children of Israel they were. This was the board of directors. This was the president. This was the vice president. This was the president's cousin. This was everybody's a who's who's list. Who's whose list? That's who went. Biggest rabbis in the world. That's who went. So you don't think, oh, these people were Shaim anyway. They went, and that's what they... No, no, no. These people were the biggest. Already, we're going to learn from the parasha. Okay, so we got to already start from the top. You're going to start looking at faces. Don't look at the average guy who barely knows Aleph Bed if he said Lashon Hara. Let's look at the top. Who's at the leader? Right? Because if it's happening, Rabotai Karim in Los Angeles, guess what? Akadosh Bahu is warning us here in Florida. Akadosh Bahu is warning us in New York. Akadosh Bahu is warning us in Tel Aviv, in Netanya, in Yerushalayim, in Arizona, everywhere. That's what Akadosh Bahu is doing. Somebody came to the Chafetz Chaim and told him, Kvod Arab, I just came back from a trip to raise some money and give Chizuk to a Keilah in Africa. <coughs> and I wanted to tell the Rab a little bit about the Keilah over there. The Chafetz Chaim says to him, hold on, before you tell me about the Kila, can you tell me a little bit more about the, the Goim over there? Are the black people still being, uh, you know, persecuted against? The rabbi says, what? Why, why, why does the Chafetz Chaim care about the Goim in Africa? He goes, no, what are you talking about? Of course I care. If something is happening to the Goim, Goim, not the Jews even, the Goim in Africa, that's a warning sign for Am Yisrael. Needless to say, if something is happening to Am Yisrael in Los Angeles, in New York, in Arizona, in Florida, in Jehennam, wherever it's happening, that's a sign for all of us. All Kol Yisrael, Aravim Zelaze. Where does it start? Oh, it says it starts with the leaders. Something going on with our leaders. Okay, let's move on. 
So we sent the leaders, we sent the leaders, and they didn't do so good. They came back with Lashon Ara. So that's the first lesson. I don't need to give you a shoe on that, because that we already know. Lashon Ara is in every Keilah. If you don't say Lashon Ara, there's something wrong with you. We have to send you to some psychiatrist. Like, why are you saying Lashon Ara? Everybody's doing it. That's all the cool kids are doing it. So, what else that Parashat Shlach say? What else does it say? So Parashat Shlach actually happens to be a parasha that is extremely scary. Not because of any details of details, but rather because of simple language that HaKadosh Baruch Hu uses to scare the lights out of us if we actually understand the parasha. First and foremost, chapter 13, verse 32, HaKadosh Baruch Hu simply says to Moshe Rabbeinu, I've had it with them. What I've had it with them, he says. He says that he's so he's had it with them to such an extent that he's considering destroying all of Am Yisrael. Chapter fourteen, actually. He says, chapter fourteen, verse eleven. Hashem says to Moshe, "How long will the people provoke me, and how long will they not have faith in me? How long you're not going to have emuna in me? Emuna about what? What do we do?" Okay, the Meraglim said Lashon Ara, but what does it have to do with us today? We'll get to that. I know, I know you, I know you got the end already. Hold on one second. Give me a minute. We'll get to the point. Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu Joshua, how long will these people provoke me? How long will they not have Emunah in me? What Emunah? What do we do? It's 2019, 5780. What Emunah? Why? Is that bad not to have Emunah? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says... Despite all the signs that I have performed for them in their midst, all the anti-Semitism, all the governments going upside down, all of the things that are happening, they didn't get the sign. I will smite them with the plague and annihilate them. And I shall make you a greater and more powerful nation than they. One of the few times in the entire Torah, Kadosh Baruch Hu really considers destroying Am Yisrael. And if it wasn't for Moshe Rabbeinu begging, and putting his own life on the line, we wouldn't be here to giving you a shiur. For what? For not having a munah? Not having a munah, that's it. Not having a munah, already how are we surviving today? Hold on, let's go on. What else? What, what is Hashem really so upset about? What is Hashem so upset about in Parashat Shlach? He's upset about the Lashon Hara, but this parasha also has other lessons in it. Not just this, not just this. What else does it have, Rabotai Karim? It has a message for us that is the message of messages. Chapter 15, verse number 32. ish mikoshesh aitzim b'yom ha-shabbat. V'yekribu oto amotzim oto mikoshesh aitzim el Moshe ve'el Aaron ve'el kol ha'eda. V'yeniku oto b'mishmar ki lo porash ma ya'ase lo. ויאמר אדוני אל משה מות יומת איש רגום אותו באבנים כל העדה מחוץ למחנה ויוציאו אותו כל העדה אל מחוץ למחנה וירגמו אותו באבנים וימות כאשר ציווה אדוני את משה The children of Israel were in the wilderness and they found a man gathering wood on Shabbat חילול Shabbat he was gathering wood he wasn't driving a car even he wasn't driving a car he wasn't driving a car. He thought he was driving a car. He wasn't driving a car. He took a bunch of wood, put it together, put a nice little rope around it. Why? He wanted to gather it. It's hard to carry all the wood one at a time. He gathered the wood. What's the big deal? HaKadosh Baruch is the big deal. It's one of the 39 restrictions you do not have permission to do on Shabbat. So, okay, well, we just got the Torah week before this. This is the second week after Matan Torah. He didn't have time to get to that halacha. Second week. We got Torah last week. This is the second week. So you didn't get the Dalachah. It's a big book. Did you read the whole Chumash in one week? Not yet. Tell you the truth, I didn't need it in one week. But don't fault me for it, because it takes more than a week. It's a big book. But over here, this person by name of Tzlovchad made a Chilul Shabbat. Why? He gathered some wood. So what did Kadosh Baruch Hu say? What, what do you, maybe give a pass. Those who found them gathering wood brought them to Moshe and Aaron and, the entire, and to the entire assembly. 
they placed him in custody, meaning jail, for it had not been clarified what should be done with him. Not what should be done with him. I'll explain what should be done with him in a minute. What does it mean, what should be done with him? Should we give a pass? It's not one of those options. So Moshe Rabbeinu goes to Hashem. Hashem, what should we do with this? Hashem says to Moshe, the man shall be put to death. The entire assembly shall pelt him with stones outside the camp. The entire assembly removed them to the outside of the camp and they pelted them with stones and he died. And as Hashem commanded Moshe. One week after Matan Torah, a person by the name of Tzlovchad, the Gemara says, Masechet Shabbat, violated Shabbat. Am Yisrael didn't know what to do with him. What do you mean you don't know what to do with him? Chilul Shabbat is death penalty. No, no, we didn't know do we, which kind of death penalty we're going to kill him with. For sure we're going to kill him. It's Chilul Shabbat. We just don't know. Is it going to be stoning? Or is it going to be a uh, chop his head off? What are we going to do with him? No, no. Hashem says, give him a death penalty and the worst kind, the one that hurts the most, stoning. You look at Gemara, Masechet Sanhedrin, Perik Chelek, what actually means stoning? Hashem Yerachem, it's scarier than my shiur about Geinom. They throw you off of a second story, just enough so you don't die. Then they throw a big boulder on top of him. Then on top of that, if you're not dead enough, everybody throws stones on him. Hashem Yerachem, what happens to this person? For what? He gathered some wood, guys. He gathered some wood. Now, Rabotai Yekarim, yes. They knew not to do what he did because there's only one Mechalel Shabbat. So let me finish the point for a second. It's relevant? He still died. Purpose or not purpose, he still died. Point is, he made a mistake. Why? Because if he didn't make a mistake, Hashem would let it go. He made a mistake, Hashem killed him. There's a machloket between Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Akiva, whether he got a second chance by being reincarnated. Different place in the Gemara. But nonetheless, we see here, now, death penalty. Why? Chilu Shabbat. This is Parashat Shlach. So what does is, what is Chilu Shabbat have to do with Emunah? What does Chilul Shabbat have to do with the leaders? What does Chilul Shabbat have to do with anti-Semitism? Well, Rabotai Yekarim, some time ago, a person came to me and asked me if I could come to Los Angeles. I said, no problem, just arrange some shiuri for me. He says, no, there's a very good keila for you, perfect. I said, why? Why is this perfect? Why is it so perfect? He says, because almost, I don't know if it's everybody, but a big part of them drive on Shabbat. I said, how do you know? How do you know they drive on Shabbat? Why? You just sit there, look at everybody. It's not nice to say Lashon We got killed for it almost in Meraglim. He goes, no, it's, it's obvious. Everybody knows. I said, how does everybody know? He says, even the non-Jews know. I said, how does the non-Jews know? What? Non-Jews know Alachot Shabbat. They know who's violating Shabbat. He goes, no, you don't understand. They have valet parking on Shabbat. Mr. Billionaire shows up with his Rolls Royce, with his Ferrari, with his Mercedes, with his whatever he's wearing, to the shul on Shabbat, on Yom Tov. And he has a little guy with a papillon, with a little bow tie waiting for him. Yes, sir, Shabbat, good Shabbos, Shabbat Shalom. Orthodox, pretending to be, uh, reform, pretending to be Orthodox. Rabotai Karim. I told him, sure, I'll come. No, no, they, 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 they wouldn't have you. You talk too strong. What's too strong? I just called, you guys called Parashat Shlach. I said Parashat Shlach also. I just said the rest of the parasha. I said the rest of the parasha. Busha v'cherpa. That we have synagogues all over the world committing the same exact crime and thinking it's kasher, thinking it's okay. Where does it start with? The beginning of the parasha. Where? Kulam anashim rasheb nei Yisrael ema. All of these distinguished men, heads of, heads of the children of Israel, whether it's the rabbis, the board of directors, the people with money, that's who's setting up the valet parking on Shabbat. Shem irachem. The rabbi works in a place like this. He's part of the crime also, even if he himself does not drive on Shabbat. Why? You allow your, you're allowing it to happen. No, no, but if I say something, they'll fire me. So let them fire you. 
But what am I going to do for food? I'm going to feed my kids. Hey, Parashat Shlach. It says Emunah. You have to have Emunah in a Kadosh Baruch Hu that will have Parnasah for you. You're on the board of directors of such a place. You're in a Kila of such a place. They don't want to change. They don't want to start this public Chilul Hashem. You leave. Why? You have to have Emunah in a Kadosh Baruch Hu. This is a public Chilul Hashem week after week. Week after week. Now if we give them Kav Shut, let's say nobody knew Allah Shabbat. The entire Kila of Orthodox Jews from all countries where their grandfathers, their grandfathers were willing to die. To die. Mamash die. Not die like, you know, no, I almost died. Like Mamash die just to keep Allah of Hanukkah. Just to keep mitzvah of tzitzit. Just to keep mitzvah of Purim. Rabbinical mitzvot. It's it is the writer, but uh, the other two. Their grandparents were willing to die, to die, mamas die, so they could light candles for Shabbat, so they could keep Shabbat, so they keep kashrut. Busha vechirpa that their grandchildren are desecrating Akadosh Baruch Hu, desecrating their grandparents, driving on Shabbat befaresia, like as if it's allowed, it's mitzvah already, and still calling themselves Jews, still call themselves Orthodox Jews. And then you have all of the newscasters, the Jewish networks. Oh, anti-Semitism. What anti-Semitism? Akadosh Baruch Hu. What anti-Semitism? What do you think? Anti-Semitism happens by itself? Akadosh Baruch Hu, he's the staff. But he's also the stick. He's the staff that leads us in certain directions, but he's also the stick that hits us if we go against him on a regular basis. The fact that they've survived this long is a miracle. Now, of course, many people are going to be offended by this message. Let you be offended. I'm glad you're offended. That means that it hit your heart. It's time that people understood what it means to be a Jew. You don't want to be a Jew? Do what you want. But don't pretend to be one. Now I'm going to ask you a question. How come in the morning... You all do Bikot HaShachar, I'm assuming, right? One of your blessings, you say, Baruch Hashem, Shalom Asani Goy. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that you didn't make me a Goy. How come we don't say, like, you know, the woman says, thank you, Hashem, for making me like you wanted. How come we don't say, thank you, Hashem, for making me a Jew? Why don't we say, thank you, Hashem, that you didn't make me a Goy? Why can't we say, thank you for making me a Jew? No, who's going to give me some answers? Louder. But wait, but we still say a blessing in the morning. You wake up in the morning, you say, Kadosh Baruch Hu, thank you for, for, for not making me a goy. Well, an answer that I'm going to give you can only come from a gadol adol. I didn't have this answer. Arab Shach, Allah wa Shalom, was asked this question. Kvod Arab, how come in the morning we don't say, thank you Hashem for making me a Jew? How come we say, thank you Hashem for not making me a Goy? Arab Shach says, that's because all HaKadosh Baruch Hu did is make you not a Goy. That's what he did. To be a Jew, that's up to you. You gotta learn Torah, you gotta do mitzvot, you gotta dress appropriately, you gotta act appropriately, you gotta fulfill the Torah. Even though the Shukhan Aruch says, What is a Jew? A Jew, his mother is a Jew. But then you go to a different part of the Shukhan, Shukhan Aruch says, What's a Jew? Oh, yeah, if he converts to Judaism. Which means that it's not just because your mother or your grandfather or your great grandmother and all of those people were Jewish. That doesn't make you a Jew, it qualifies you to be a Jew. Because you could also convert to Judaism if your grandfather is Yoshke. Your grandfather is Haman himself. Who cares who your grandfather is? You want to be a Jew, you, you're allowed to convert. No problem. Baruch Haba, in fact, the Rambam says, if you're a righteous convert, we're obligated. The Jews are obligated to love you more than they love regular Jews that are born that way. In fact, we're obligated to love the converts as much as we love God. A Jew that's born natural, born Jew, we're obligated to love him as much as we love ourselves. A convert, that's a righteous convert, we're obligated to love him or her as much as we love a Kadosh Baruch Hu himself, even more than ourselves. 
So here we learn that Judaism is not necessarily only based on who your mother is. Because Haman, the Gemara says, Haman is grandkids taught Torah in Bnei Brak, Big Rabbanim. Haman was a Rasha Amalek. Amalek. Tried to kill Allah Israel, but what? His grandkids became big rabbis. Meaning that you could be a Jew, no matter where your background is, no matter who your father is, who your mother is. You want to be a Jew, you could be a Jew. But that also means that you could be born of a Jewish mother and a Jewish father, and they could both be rabbis. In fact, they could both be Gdolei Ado. Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, whatever you want. But in the eyes of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, you're a Goy 100%. But you're judged as a Jew, but you're acting like a Goy. Why? Because in order to be a go, in order to be a Jew, Rabotai Karim, you have to act like one. You have to fulfill the Torah. Judaism only began at Mount Sinai when we got the Torah. Anyone that fulfills the Torah, in accordance to what we have, that's a Jew. Anyone that violates the Torah, it's not a Jew. His Judaism is on suspension. Now he doesn't have to convert if he violated Shabbat his whole life. And now he wants to start keeping Shabbat in order for him to be a Jew again. He doesn't have to go through a conversion process, go to a Din. No, he just keeps Shabbat, finished. He is, his Judaism that was on suspension for 30, 40 years is no longer on suspension. Why? He's no longer driving on Shabbat. He's keeping Shabbat. He's keeping Halakha. He's trying the best that he can with all the knowledge that he has. Whatever he knows, he does. Whatever she knows, she does. 